back to our reading there, and we can read again at the end of chapter 13, the last verse, verse 18. It's often been filled with great mystery, trying to understand verse 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. The answer to the meaning of the number of the beast seems to be given in the verse itself. Well, it is three sixes. It's one short of seven. There is a trinity of sixes, and we're told that the number six, 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 is the number of a man. Not that someone is to be identified with the letters of their name adding up to 666. That was done historically nor that there is to be any additions of any kind or subtractions or multiplications needed. Man was created on day six, and God is the one who is perfect and often referred to in Scripture with the number seven. The number 666 is the unholy trinity that finds its expression in mankind. Satanic attempts at global domination. And people sometimes take verse 18 We've, we've all done it, I'm sure, and we've tried to understand it apart from the rest of the chapter. And the rest of the chapter tells us who the beasts are and what they represent. And the beasts are Satan's agents. There's two of them. The beast that rises out of the sea is clearly described as a ruling power. The beast that rises out of the earth is a spiritual power. They're both spiritually animated. They're both empowered by, by Satan. The dragon gives them the authority and the power to do what they do. But the beast that rises out of the earth compels people to follow and listen to the beast that rises out of the sea. What it really seems to be speaking about, the first thing that is satanic persecution through world government Hopefully that'll make sense as we read along. The second, it's a spiritual uh, deception through this second beast who's also referred to, interestingly, later on in three places as being the false prophet. And to just add another thing to it, in the next chapter, there's reference to Babylon. And that's uh, to be added on to satanic persecution, satanic deception, but there's also satanic seduction. She's pictured as the prostitute, Babylon, seducing and getting a hold of the whole world. People who choose not to follow the ways of the Lord. Now, we tried looking at chapter 12 last, last week, but which was in some respects maybe more straightforward and clearer, but it's not in any way to be disconnected from chapter 13. Chapter 12 ends with Satan standing on the sand of the sea, and he's, he's scheming and he's planning. What's happened in the previous chapter is that he and his angels have been barred from having any access to the presence of God in heaven. The argument would flow from Job chapter 1 and 2 that there was a time prior to Christ's ascension where Satan and fallen demons along with him would have had some sort of access into God's presence, whatever that means. And the reason we say that is we picture that very thing happening in Job, chapters 1 or 2, unless we understand it as an allegory or spiritualizing historical facts, unless we take it, of course, I think it should be taken like the rest of the book in a literal way. The history recorded in Job, those, there's lots of imagery and, and powerful imagery to convey truth throughout the book that we don't take literally, symbolism and illustrations and things. The history in the book, however, I think is to be taken historically, as much as Job is a historical figure and James talks about having heard of the patience of Job. Zechariah always, and I think it also in think it chapter, it's chapter 3, one of the minor prophets towards the end of the Old Testament, has a picture of Satan accusing Joshua the high priest, accusing him. So what Satan's doing to, uh, to Job before God, is he's trying to discredit, undermine, and accuse Job of trusting God just because God has made his life easy. You've put a hedge around him. But touch him, 
touch his life and he'll curse you to your face. The picture we have in these two chapters, Job, well, two sections, Job 1 and 2 and also in Zechariah, is of Satan having some sort of access. Zechariah, the prophecy, you may think of it in a more spiritualized, illustrative way, but I think the truth stands if we understand this literally in these sections and having an explanation given here in this chapter. It's not to confuse things. Early on in the chapter, we're told in chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, is, I think, the picture of Satan's fall from heaven. And the reason for that is that as soon as he and the, and the host he brings down with him are cast out of heaven, they're on the war path for a woman who is pregnant, about to give birth to a male child. And Satan is pictured as having been cast down to earth and on the hunt for this special son who's going to be born in the fullness of time. The woman who's described as being clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, having a crown of 12 stars. You can think of Joseph's dream of his family bowing down to him. The imagery seems to be there. The picture of the Old Testament church. And when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. And you see the picture. In verse 5, she gives birth to a male child. Despite all of Satan's efforts, we notice throughout the Old Testament, even down to Athaliah, when there was one legitimate heir to the Davidic throne, meaning there was one ancestor of Christ, according to the flesh, left. He was spared. And from him, that one descendant, that one legitimate heir to the throne of David, when he then was upon the throne, had his family, the generations then went from one to another, and our Lord was born. Satan couldn't prevent him from being born, couldn't devour him. When he was born, though, he tried to use Herod the Great to do that. And so when he realizes he couldn't prevent the birth of the child, this special child, male child, verse 5 of chapter 12, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, who is caught up to God and to his throne. We know who that is. We know who the male child is. And John has the clear echo allusion to Psalm 2 and what he says. In describing this special son, the dragon, the beast, Satan, was trying to prevent from being born. And when he was born, he tried to kill him. And when he couldn't kill him, he turns on this woman who is described as, and it's symbolic, of course, as being this special child's mother, the Old Testament church. We've thought of that as that section in Romans, that um, from whom, yes, when Paul, in, I think, chapter 10 of Romans, where he's lamenting the fact lamenting the fact that his own people aren't saved. And he's saying that it's not that God has cast them off or undermined his own purposes, but he and, and in saying that he describes these Jewish people, Israel, as being those from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. The woman is described as the Old Testament church, personified as a woman in childbirth, giving birth to this special child. Some people see Mary, but it's important. Mary obviously is our Lord's mother, that highly honored and favored woman in that amazing, unique situation. But it isn't Mary who's being referred to in this illustration. The result of that, when the Son of God is caught up to heaven, his ascension, there's a reference to Satan and his angels being overcome and beaten by Michael and the unfallen angels. Not the fall that happens before the fall of man in Genesis. He's already earlier on in chapter 12 described as being uh, cast down to the earth. And his tail sweeps a third of the host with him. He takes a lot of the angels with him who rebel and they rebel against God. But after the ascension of Christ, the great dragon was thrown down. Verse 9 says that ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, and it's explained in verse 10. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. This is it. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. That is now over. He can no longer accuse in the presence of God. Romans 8 makes it clear. A fascinating, glorious where the questions put, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who's going to make an alley? Who's going to be an accuser? 
Who's going to make an accusation? This isn't, this isn't someone accusing us of doing wrong. That's not what's being referred to. But as we're mentioning in, and we're praying together, it's that no one can bring an accusation against us to God. Not that they can't pray and speak about our faults and ask for... It's not that. The ideas of guilt, not of actual sin. And God's... Well, God's forgetfulness or non-remembrance amounts to his non-imputation of the guilt and the liability of punishment. He isn't oblivious to facts. God cannot compartmentalize his infinite mind and leave something there. It's that he chooses, in a way we cannot understand, to not remember. And to, by not remembering, it's not that he forgets. It's that he chooses not to impute it to us. Psalm 32 says that, doesn't it? Blessed is the man, the woman, to whom the Lord imputeth not their sin. Well, the sin is there. But by imputing, it's being held accountable. Who is going to bring a charge against God's elect, Romans 8 says? It is God. It is God who justifies as Christ that risen, who is even at the right hand of God and makes intercession for us. You see, the, the, the picture I think John is bringing before us is that one who used to be able to bring an accusation into the presence of God against the people of God has now got the greater than he who is in the world at God's right hand to make intercession for them. If anyone sins, John says, we have an advocate with the Father. It's a, it's a, it's a courtroom scene, humanly speaking, where we have someone who pleads our case. His very presence, chapter 5 of Revelation, shows him appearing in heaven as the lamb who had been slain. And in that capacity, he is there as the one who has accomplished, fulfilled all that was needed for us to be saved and to be accepted by God the Father. It wasn't possible for God to simply say, I forgive and I will not remember their sin. Justice had to be done. No one but the Son of God, God himself, could ever pay the price to God's justice. And when we're thinking of prices and payments, and we tend to think maybe in terms of numbers and, 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 and a, a, an increasing volume of sin as a mass, it's to think of it more, I think, in terms of legally being obliged to pay for the sins we've committed. That has all been taken away. And the advocacy of Christ in one respect in heaven, as our great advocate, as our intercessor and mediator, is he is saying, by his very presence, it is finished. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Our hearts condemn us. Very often and very powerfully sometimes, other people can condemn us. And, you know, that, 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 not, not, in, not in the kind of, uh, like they shouldn't, but remember with, um, the pro God sent Nathan to David and pinpointed the very thing. And that's part of God, is it not, dealing with the present and the ongoing reality of sin in our lives. He knows it. He sees it. He points it out, but he doesn't hold it against us. The presence of Christ as our great high priest in the heavenly places is the very, his representative, even his, his position, his very presence in heaven speaks volumes. He is there as the Lamb who had been slain. Satan could not anymore bring an accusation. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He cannot bring an allegation to God about you. He cannot. He'll bring allegations about you to you and to me. And he'll bring allegations about other people to us and play with our heads and our thoughts and our outlooks and all the rest of it. And he can, you know, like, he, like um, the Lord said to, to Peter, wasn't it? Satan has not just desired to have you, it's more he has asked for you plural, all of you. He wants the lot of you. But he says to Peter in the singular, but I prayed for you. He wants to sift you like wheat. Peter sees him later on his, in, his, in his, um, his first letter as the roaring lion. He had firsthand experience of the wiles, he calls them, uh, 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 Paul calls them the wiles of the devil, the schemes, Ephesians 6, the schemes the subtle scheme. So he cannot bring an accusation in heaven against us, but he will bring accusations against us down here on earth. 
And that's for us to come when we're feeling guilty and shameful and broken and, you know, when we feel written off. And, you know, it's like, you know, a Christian can, as you know, and, and, and maybe shockingly we can think of some in the Bible. Think of Solomon and Samson, they maybe stand out. There's other characters, of course, but the thought of how far away from God and the paths of righteousness even God's people can end up going. What would we have said as an example of these two uh, individuals, amazing people that they were, Samson and Solomon? What would, you know, to see what happened and would we believe it possible and would we be so theological to argue that that is incompatible with God's grace in someone's heart and life? Well, of course it is compatible. It's, it's not that, you know, because we would say, we would probably, and maybe we have said, wrongly maybe, or because we said it the way we did or thought it the way we did, that that person cannot be a Christian. Rather than thinking, well, this isn't the behavior of a Christian. And the, the great John Owen, the English Puritan, he said on one occasion, um, he was talking about somebody in a position like that, that that person has no right to say that they're a Christian. It's not for us to think we've got the right to say they're a Christian or not, but only that this is not in line with what the Bible is saying. You need to be careful. This is maybe a fine distinction, but we, we're very judgmental. So maybe, maybe when, maybe when um, we consider these, these things and think of our own lives and we can realize, well, though maybe things are only on the inside and can seem to be concealed and hidden or behind doors and on the outside, everything, things, everything seems normal, and, but on the inside, we know it's not the case. Will the Lord deal with our hearts if that's the case, if we're fine on the outside, but all judgmental and critical on the inside, without realizing ourselves, if that's the case. And the, way we, the further we drift from God, we won't, we won't see ourselves as, as being the man or the woman that, that God is saying is at fault in a situation. It will always be someone else's fault. Our fallenness comes out and we'll blame, or justi- blame this or that or maybe justify it by uh, whatever arguments we'll bring. But it's when we come to the place where our heart gets us and we've got to put our hands up and say, it, it, you know, Psalm 51, against you only I have sinned. I have sinned and done this evil in your sight and a readiness for God to pronounce accordingly. But as we read through such as Psalm 51 becomes very clear, does it not? And it's a wonderful thing that there's hope in the psalm. That when Judas went out and wept, when Judas was so uh, uncontrollably distraught at what he had done, there was no way out for him. When Peter wept bitterly, there's repentance. And, and doesn't Paul talk about that in Second Corinthians, that, the, that there's, there's a, the sorrow... The sorrow of the world leads to death. But he talks about godly sorrow that works repentance. It's not feeling guilty. It's the change that we put into, put into effect as a result of it. Do we see Peter lying anymore or publicly denying Jesus? He was crushed by what he did. He was broken spiritually. Psalm 51, David said, my bones. He feels smashed to pieces by God chastised, coming under the rod. So Satan might accuse us. And he might blind us to ourselves in that regard so we don't see how we really are spiritually. One way that that might show itself is that we are highly judgmental of other people. So we'll accuse others. We'll do his work for him without knowing that we're, maybe by condemning others, we're condemning ourselves. Yes, that's what he says in Romans. Although he's not talking to the, the Christian, but how the world is, he's, he's saying that you are inexcusable, whoever you are that judges another. What does he say? For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. The old Bible had just got that way of sticking in your memory. You're condemning yourself, he's saying, because you're doing the same things. But we don't see it. And, you know, a challenge, we move on in just, just a minute, there's a real challenge 
there's a book, um, you've maybe seen it, Jerry Bridges, it's called Respectable Sins, the things that we tolerate. It's not the big and the bad, it's the things we tolerate that we think are less sinful. And we don't sit down and think, oh, this is less sinful, so I'll say that or whatever. But we do have this way within our conscience. Again, it was mentioned in prayer, we need to be so informed and, and filling our minds with the truth of God's word to see clearly the Holy Spirit enlightening us in what's taking place at a, a given time, that we are actually the ones who need to, um, to change. Satan is crazy. Well, that's what he says. He has come down with great wrath. Now, that's someone who's out of control, isn't it? Great wrath. He's furious because he couldn't prevent Christ from being born. He's furious because he can no longer accuse the, present, the, 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 the people of God in the presence of God, as it were, to God's face. Now, that's expressive saying that, but Satan himself said that about Job. He'll curse you to your face. There's something not really not nice about even putting it in that language. It's, 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 it's so offensive. It's such an affront to God. It's so blasphemous. He's actually trying to accuse God of favoritism in a sense, and that's the only reason he loves you is because you're giving him an easy life. But turn these things around and that's all Satan thinks about. He doesn't know grace. He doesn't know what it is to rejoice even with things being taken away and in not having. He just thinks of domination and control, complete and utter control of everything and everyone against God. That's where he's happy. And that's what he promises. Even to our Lord, all these things I will give to you if you but bow down and worship me. Well, he's furious. It's all gone now. It's not that his power is all gone. But the picture we have coming into chapter 13 is what Satan does as a result of having been unable to stop Christ from being born and being unable to um, kill him or stop him from going to the cross. And the fact that the accomplishment of the ascension and everything that he came into the world to do, the fact that that has all been done and that he is now thrown down, he's going everywhere in a, in a, in a fury and uh, in a rage. So there's two things he does. He is, and, and what's amazing, it was so important, and you know it stood out earlier on just reading through this, and if you would later, and if you wanted to compare even translations, everything that you read in chapter 13, Satan is allowed to do. It's not that he does that he is allowed to do it. Which means even in the, the horror of the darkness of these, these words, God is in control. The horror of, of these words, well, the, the beast that rises out of the sea, there, there's numbers, he's got ten hordes, ten horns, seven, I mean ten, ten is a, a, like fullness. When you think of seven as perfection and completion, here he is, Satan is behind, and we know it's Satan behind it. He's described as the dragon in, in ver the end of verse 2, who gives his power and his throne and great authority to this beast, this organization, a horrid-looking creature, the body of a leopard, feet of a bear, and mouth of a lion, unstoppable, fast, and destructive, and wants nothing but complete control. What does that look like? Well, who is it, and what are the numbers? We don't need to worry or to be concerned, it's getting the, getting the gist of what's going on. That's, I think, all, all that we have to do. When we get bogged down in details, it's like we won't see the wood because of the trees. It's there staring us in the face, but we're concerned with maybe a thing that isn't of primary importance. This beast has, we're told, seven heads. Rises out of the sea, it has seven heads. It's very like Daniel's vision of world power. Go back to Daniel, John is echoing that. This beast appears to have had a mortal wound, so it looks like Satan's power and kingdom and dominion was over. I think that's meaning the cross. Now is the judgment of this world. He said, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And at that amazing time, and in that amazing situation, it's what was referred to, remember in Genesis 3, 15, that when he, Satan would seek to, 
to destroy the seed of the woman. He said, he will crush your head. You will bruise his heel. Mortally wounded. You crush the snake's head, he's finished. The blow was dealt to Satan at Calvary. The war isn't over, though. The victory has been won, but the war is still raging and still going on. And it would appear towards the end of the age, it's going to, we say that because these um, visions, these pictures, as they come in a cycle form, they end each one with a judgment. You can see that and see where the book, how the book is divided in that way. But what to notice about these, these um, images, the beasts, is that John sees them rising. They don't just appear. There's a gradual emergence from the sea. The sea is often put in Scripture as, an, as God's enemy. Some have even suggested, mentioned in, in a minute ago, about the, the wind and the, and the, the sea in, in Galilee. If the Lord, we're told, he rebuked them. Some have suggested maybe there was something behind that storm that was demonic. I don't know. But certainly the raging sea, Psalm 93, Psalm 89, even in the raging of the sea, thou over it does rain. And the floods raising up their voices, the chaos of Psalm 46, the opening verses, its opposition to God, it's, it's chaos, it's upheaval. It's pictured as mankind in opposition to God at times and Satan energizing this beast to come out from humanity and gradually rising. Now, the fact of it's coming to a height, we see there from verse, um, we see that from verse three in fact, given this power and given this ability, the authority that it's given, the throne that it's given and the power that it is given. This is an organization that is Global, that's dominant, that's powerful, because we're told in verse uh, 2, the dragon, Satan, he's, he, well, that's who the dragon is, he's described in chapter 12. He gives this organization power and dominion and great authority. How exactly? It's not spelled out, but we're told that people are going to see the emergence of Satan through this power. And they are going to be deceived into thinking that this is the true religion. Notice that. Verse 3, when all his head seems to have a mortal wound, but his mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon. They didn't realize they were worshipping Satan. You think of this. You go back to the Roman Empire. This would possibly be very, well, very much in John's mind. It was very real in the situation. They, 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 well, we read it, did we not, on, on, on Sunday night? It was at the, chapter, the end of the chapter previous where Herod, who put on and made this, this great speech and um, was dazzling, and the people said, it's the voice of a god. And don't they say, Caesar is Lord? The Roman emperor was seen as a godlike figure. It was transferred and has been carried over blasphemously by the pope. That whole office is viewed as being godlike, very anti-Christian. But see, because this power emerges, it seems as though it has been in, in almost in the background, in the shadows for a long time. Because as the beast emerges, picturing what's happening, Satan can't stop Christ being born, chapter 12. Christ is ascended to heaven. Satan's cast down to earth. He turns on the church. He can't destroy the church. The book of Acts, he can't destroy the church. External persecution, you see what's happening there in, in, in um, starting as in on chapters 3 and 4 and 5 with healings and miracles and the, 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 those involved in killing Christ, according to the flesh, are now involved in trying to stop the church from spreading. They can't. So what does Satan then do? He gets, an, he gets an Ananias and Sapphira to lie and be deceptive. So he comes with a strategy from inside, tries to destroy the church. And we know it's him doing it because Peter rebukes them in these terms. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You see what he's doing? Can't stop Christ being born, being crucified, or ascending to heaven. He can't stop it. So when he's thrown down to earth as a result and no longer having access to heaven... He turns on the church. We read that at the end of chapter 12. And when he can't destroy the church, he takes another tactic. 
So we're moving past acts in history. And there's this power that's rising, rising out of the sea. The sea being the upheaval, the rebellious human race against God. And they are just ready for the emergence of this beast, this power. Because they see, and I think what we know from the, the rest of the Bible, that the wound on his head at the cross was a mortal wound. Satan is defeated. Though in this age, as chapter 20 shows, towards the end of it, he'll be let loose for a little season. This is what's happening. We know that because, look, just look here in verse 5. We'll, we'll, we'll stop in just a moment. We'll come back to the, the second beast another time. We'll try to. But he says in verse 5, The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, three and a half years. A limited period. But it opens, verse 6, his mouth to utter blasphemies against God, his name, his dwelling. And then verse 7, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. This is the government. This is a world government. This is Satan's um, ideal yet to come. Prefigured in many empires, the Babylonians, the Romans, the Nazis, things like that. But verse 7 is showing us that it hasn't reached that climax in any way where it was allowed the beast to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And we're told it was authority was given to it over every tribe and people and language and nation. The United Nations, that's prefiguring this. How often, I don't mean to bore you or, or, or for you to be in any way put off at the thought of hearing again about what is called the World Economic Forum. We are living in, I don't know if you believe this. I don't know if you've checked it for yourself. And what you're seeing with these today, what's happening in London with the, the ULES zones, this is all part of the 2030 project of the World Economic Forum, locking, locking down parts of Oxford, allowing you, only allowing certain vehicles, and you're going to pay a certain amount. It's all, all of this green agenda. Some people believe it. They believe that this is all a real thing, what, what they're planning. But when you, when you look at it, it's, it's part, you see it in Canada, what's happening in Canada, with the, the prime minister there, and please look into this for yourself. I know one person who, first time was mentioned, they were so thankful. It's called the Great Reset, the plan for 2030. This is all going on behind this. You've got Bill Gates, you've got all these guys going annually to these forums. You can access their websites. You can watch videos. And all the green things that are happening. Lock down this. United Nations, we'll have the power to decide when there's the next pandemic, and we have been given, they've been given the authority to announce lockdowns again. Whether they should have the first time round, to the extent they were, that was, that was maybe prefiguring some of these things. Just look at China. You'll be publicly shamed in China if you're seen what they call jaywalk. If you don't cross the road in the right place, pedestrian crossing, They've got screens up. Look at this. You'll see it for yourself. You've got screens up and you're publicly shamed. And because your money becomes digitized, it's controlled by the government. We're going cashless. It's all happening. And the references later will come back to with the mark of the beast, not being able to buy or sell, no economic input, a cashless society all being digitized. It's, it's, it's hard to believe this. It isn't conspiracy theory at all. What our government are doing and what other authorities are doing is what people who are non-elected, powerful, wealthy, uh, controllers of most of what's um, accessible to, to, to um, the, the global economy and so on, the people who are pushing the buttons behind the scenes, you can see governments, the Western governments are puppets. You'll see Russia, and this isn't to be political or justify or anything, you'll see there are other nations going the other way. You'll see some African nations just now going the other way. It's no longer the dollar that's going to decide. The currencies are changing. Everything is changing. There's an agenda behind it. And when you read this, the reference being made in verse 16 of the chapter, all 
small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, are going to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. Everything will be digitized. It used to be, you know, back in the 80s and so on, there's a bit of hype maybe about barcodes and chips and all that, and oh, we just put it away and it's rubbish. It's not. If you look at what is being planned, even frighteningly, what's being uh, going on with artificial intelligence, super-powered computers. People, Elon Musk is scared, terrified of the potential of these machines, generating not just fake news and all, all of that we hear a lot about, but the, the, the way these machines can be pre-programmed. And um, one of, again, please, if you would do this, yeah, it's hard to believe it, to even read it, a man who's an advisor to this World Economic Forum, is talking about AI will be able to come up with its own religion. A combination of all, you know when you think of you do a Google search and it's there. It's researching, it's searching, and it's drawing together the information that's out there. And if the information that's out there is all wrong, it's been all drawn together and put into it. People can do essays, you can do all sorts of things with um, that kind of technology at the moment in its relative infancy but there's no way of knowing that it's true and it can be used for the wrong purposes. But this man was basically saying, viewing the super intelligence that they are creating, Google are creating, Google, people have left these companies. Please look at this. This maybe sounds crazy, but it's, it's happening. And we should be afraid. You see it in China there was not that a few weeks ago, as I can't remember which American state, people were, it's almost like they were brainwashed to do it, flocking to have their irises read, to have their own unique, you know, you do it with your phone, you can do it with your fingerprints and all that, it's, it's all there. But everything goes cashless, it's all digitized. We can be tracked on our phone. Elon Musk talking about Neuralink, implanting uh, chips into the brain, it's almost having your phone as it were. And it, it, it doesn't sound real, but to be tracked, as an individual, everything controlled, which to us sounds outrageous. And we're living so secluded in many ways from what's happening all around us. But you see what's going on behind the scenes. And when it's staring us in the face and we're just not thinking about it, the fourth industrial revolution, they are wanting the great reset, everything to change. And they're pushing their puppets in government to do this. It's very interesting. Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, his father worked for the Nazis. Just leave it there. Please look into it. Don't, don't, uh, it's, it's the kind of thing you'd rather not have to, but you were reading this. Do we believe, do we believe that this is God's word? Of course we do. Are people, are we to be kind of fanatical and think, oh, we see what's happening? Well, I think we're not thinking right if we keep our eyes shut. And we have to remember the children who are coming after us in all of this. You know, the worst thing is what Hezekiah said. And we'll finish. It's what Hezekiah said when God warned him. After he opened and showed all his treasuries to the Babylonians, he came to see him after his recovery. He said, oh, well, it won't be in my lifetime. What a frightening attitude. Yeah. But that period is coming before you see the influence of the, the beast that's described as coming out of the earth, the false prophet. If you go back to chapter 11 and read about the beast that comes out of the abyss and the fact that it destroys two witnesses... So that, and this is a picture that we're just reading, the church being stamped out of existence for a period of time with the emergence of this global superpower that will be in con control of everything, in control of the economy. And you're seeing the dollar crashing and all this going on. This is, this is, you can see it. They're planning it. Digital currency, control everything. You won't be allowed, you won't be allowed to buy X amount of pay. You go buy so much fuel for your vehicle. Well, you try to, you won't be allowed to. They'll decide what you're going to buy. You know man might buy or sell. But having the mark, 
having that wherewithal is only going to belong to those whose names are not written in the book of life. The whole world will wander and worship the beast. When people are going to be brought down economically, you can't access your money, the banks, all, all of this, when that isn't going to be possible. People don't want to think of that possibly have, of not having access to what is yours. That's the, that's, the, that's the objective behind all of this. You're therefore dependent. They can lock you down. They can make you ask them and be dependent on them for everything. But with satanic deception and all of this, we're thinking, how on earth could people be so foolish to believe that we have no understanding of how powerful satanic deception can be? Jesus says it in Matthew 24 about the false prophets coming with signs and wonders. And we look at other expressions of Christian false prophets. This is people, I think, who are speaking a different message from Christianity altogether with the intention to deceive, he says, if it were possible, the very elect. Has the church been faced with such a deception yet? The church. Well, we're actually thinking, could this be true? You know, when you're kind of shaking about it, well, I think that's what's been pointed to by John, this coming... Um, Arrival, the beast is emerging. It's always been there, it has, but it's emerging. And when it's emerging out of the sea and the air, it'll reach its full expression, Satan's little season towards the end of the age. It should be exciting to us. Traumatizing sometimes, but exciting in the sense that we do pray, surely, thy kingdom come. It's coming. And in the kingdom coming, all of these things are going to come to pass before he comes. It's a short period of suffering, three and a half days, compared to the thousand years of chapter 20. So part of a vast period, the New Testament age, but a short time towards the end. Satan is let loose, going around with great wrath because he knows his time is short. But the Lord is coming. And he's going to bring all of this to an end. We'll see the next part, God willing, next time. We'll pray just now. We'll pray. Lord our God, we ask for the grace that we need to pray and to think about your word and to be open to listen to what you're saying to us daily. We ask, Lord, for your grace to be upon all who need you tonight. There's so many different situations, so many different needs. We pray for all who are struggling and in need in any way. We grant strength and grace and peace and your blessing and restoration, and grant, Lord, that vision, that this amazing book, it's really hard for us to understand, but show us the meaning of what you want us to know, and what we have to understand, because you tell us so often, it's those who overcome who will be saved, and maybe we're finding gradually a return to how the church existed in the first century, when the Roman Empire was opposed, and where we thought on Sunday night, your servant Paul having to face the very emperor of Rome, which led to his execution. The rising again of these powers, satanic deception, global domination, and man at the very center of it. But Lord, you reign, and you will come, and you will avenge your people, and you will reveal your glory. Help us, we pray, to be looking for that blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in his name. Amen. Let's get the psalm book. Let's sing in conclusion, shall we, from Psalm 85. This is, again, the Scottish Psalter 85. And at verse 5, page 339. Page 339. And singing at verse 5, Shall thy displeasure thus endure against us without end? Will thou to generations all thine anger forth extend? We'll sing down to verse 9, Psalm 85 from verse 5, Shall thy displeasure thus endure? Shall thy
good, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.